Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a preview of the U.S. Supreme Court's new session, which started Monday. And we'll meet the executive producer of PBS's Great Performances. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Undersecretary for Health from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs was at the troubled Phoenix VA Center today as its new director was introduced. The Undersecretary, David Shulkin, addressed the latest Inspector General's report that was critical of the Phoenix VA facility. The Office of Inspector General report we are taking very seriously because it indicates that we have more work to do and that we have issues to address. But I want to be perfectly clear, there is no evidence, as has been reported in some cases, that there were hundreds of veterans that died because of uh, consult delays or canceled consults. So the OIG report showed us that we still have work to do. We're taking that seriously, but we want people to understand the facts. We want people to understand there is progress being made here in Phoenix, and part of that progress is bringing the right permanent leaders here to continue that progress and be able to, to address veterans' needs. Shulkin also spent the day talking with veterans at the VA hospital and listening to their concerns. The United States Supreme Court began its new session Monday. The high court went back to work as an eight member bench with the U.S. Senate still refusing to consider a replacement for Justice Antonin Scalia, who died in February. Here now to talk about the court in general and a few high-profile cases in particular is ASU law professor Paul Bender. Welcome back. Good to see you. Good to be here, Ted. Uh, the impact of this continued vacancy, I mean, this has been going on for quite a while here, and it looks like it's not going to end anytime soon. What's the impact here? The impact of the vacancy itself is not so big. The court can get along with eight people. They'll have a few tie votes. The biggest thing that's going to happen at the Supreme Court this year is who is going to be the next justice. And even more importantly, the biggest thing that's going to happen in the Supreme Court next year is the election for president. Depending on that election, the, the character of the Supreme Court can be radically different if, uh, if Trump wins versus if, if Clinton wins. Why is that? Because there's already one, there's immediately one vacancy. You have two other people in their 80s. Justice Ginsburg and, and Justice Kennedy, and you have somebody who's getting close there, Justice Breyer. Uh, so the next president may have two or three appointments. The court's been so closely divided that if uh, Clinton would become president and would be able to fill the Scalia vacancy, replace two of those people, you would have a solid liberal majority on the court, and they'd be there for quite a while because people like uh, Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor are relatively young. And it's not only liberal, it's those are young people who have ideas and creativity. And so you might see a real change in American constitutional law, which has been in a very dull period for the last 15 to 20 years. On the other hand, if Trump wins and gets to replace Scalia and two more people like Scalia on the court, that would, in, that would establish a solid, very conservative majority, again for a long time, because Roberts and Alito and Thomas are not that young. So that's the most important thing for the court. So uh, if Clinton wins yeah. and she goes ahead and uh, finds someone who is considered relatively far left, not, not center left, but far left, I mean, is there any chance that the Senate might just say, ain't going to happen? I should have amended what I said before. It's not only who wins the presidency, it's who wins the Senate. That can make a big difference. Clinton with a Democratic Senate, you might get different appointments, probably would get different appointments, and, and Clinton with a Republican Senate. So that's the, and the justices are aware of that, and that's why I think you're seeing a court that is, has taken less cases and seems reluctant to take big cases. One of the big cases it took before Justice Scalia died, and I think they took it for a reason, they put off the oral argument. Uh, it was taken in January. They're arguing cases that were, uh, that were granted in June, they, maybe because they were hoping that the vacancy would be filled before they had argument. That's not going to happen, uh, so they'll probably have to ha have it done. But I think you can tell when you read the court's arguments, I read some of the transcripts, today of the arguments of the last two days, that the, the atmosphere on the court has changed. Justice Scalia is not there to interrupt and make it difficult for people to argue against him. 
uh, poor Justice Alito doesn't have anybody to follow in that, and, and he is not, and Roberts is not, doesn't do that, and Thomas doesn't speak. And so the court seems to be, when you hear these cases argue, a liberal court already. So it's, it, it, as we've mentioned before, the, the previous time has been on the program, seems to be drifting left, if only because Justice Kennedy seems to be drifting left. Is, is that still occurring? Well, it happened last year. Last year, Kennedy agreed with the liberals uh, in closely divided cases more often, I think twice as much, as he agreed with the conservatives. That never used to happen. He always con agreed with the conservatives more. So he's moving, you can tell, say, from the gay marriage case. Not in every case, but in some areas, like the death penalty, Kennedy is moving in that direction. So that's already happening. If, if you get a justice, uh, if you get a President Clinton to replace Scalia and then to put one or two other justices, they, you could go back to the days when you had a really creative Supreme Court, which tried to focus on some of the real problems that there are in the United States, income disparities, for example, um, health disparities. The court has done nothing in that area. There was a time when it was thought the court couldn't deal with those kinds of social problems, but the Warren Court did try to deal with those things, and then the court stopped. So that could happen again, uh, depending on who wins the election. You referred to this earlier, fewer cases than usual this term, no apparent blockbusters. Right. Is that because of that missing seat? I think it very well could be that, because suppose you're a justice on the court, you know the court's closely divided, you see a case, you don't know how that case is gonna come out, it depends on who the next justice is gonna be. So you might say, let's wait and see whether I'm gonna grant, vote to grant cert here because I'm gonna be against it if so-and-so wins the election, I'll be for it if so-and-so. So I think there's that general feeling of reluctance to do any more than they have to do until they see who wins the election. Which gives a lot of power to those lower courts, doesn't it? Well, yeah, although they can hold things for a while. Yeah, okay. That's another thing. They don't have to act on cert petitions right away. A couple of cases here in particular, Peña Rodriguez v. Colorado. This regards what racial statements made in deliberations. Yes. This is a really interesting and potentially important case. In that case, after somebody was convicted, uh, two of the jurors filed affidavits saying one of the other jurors had made biased statements about Hispanics, Mexicans, during the, the defendant was a Mexican, during the deliberations, oh, he's a Mexican man, of course he did that, all Mexicans do that kind of thing, that's what was said. And they said, you know, that we, they're really worried about that. And the issue is, assuming he said that, whether the court is going to go into that. The courts have had a tradition of not letting jurors impeach their own verdicts. That is, you don't let jurors after the verdict come into court and say, oh, that was bad, I shouldn't have voted that way, or somebody else made me do that or something like that. Because if you do that, uh, you open everything up to complaints after the verdict. But this is a very, very troubling thing. If, 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 if you're clear that a juror voted on the basis of racial prejudice, do you sit by and let that happen? So it's a difficult issue for the court. So the entire jury may say uh, guilty, okay? But because the one jury, juror said guilty, not by reason of evidence, but by reason of his own bias, the question is, is that a unanimous verdict? Well, right. And so the, you, know, you never know, because you never know what would have happened if you had a non-biased person there. And also you don't know how much the biased statements influence the other judges. So the issue there is, is that a fair trial? Is that a fair jury? Interesting. Uh, and the courts never dealt with that. And if they were to give, I was surprised they took that case, if they were to give relief in this case, that would open up the door to jurors challenging verdicts all over the place. Well, I mean, you can have a juror in there nodding off asleep, not paying attention, or a juror who thinks that we, we have, you know, Martians are about ready to attack us, not dealing in, you know. Right. You could have all sorts of things. Exactly. When you start getting into what the jurors were thinking, yes. it becomes very dangerous. Another uh, uh, racial component in another case here, uh, Buck v. Davis, what's that all about? Yeah, Buck v. Davis is that. That's the case, I, I got to re refresh my recollection on these. Oh yeah, that's the case of, this is also very troubling. In that case, it's a death penalty case. And in that case, the defendant's appointed lawyer called as an expert of a psychologist. The, the issue was on sentencing. It, uh, it, he was guilty, everybody agrees he's guilty. The question is should he get the death sentence? That turns in large part on whether he's gonna be dangerous, whether if he ever gets out, he'll be dangerous. 
the defendant's own lawyer called an expert who said, oh, black men are more dangerous than other people. In the defendant, there was a black person. Uh, and that guy had testified in eight other cases in the same way. Uh, the, the Texas Attorney General decided to vacate those seven, those eight others, but didn't in this one. The thing about that is that case and the case of the, of the jurors saying something racially bigoted in, in the uh, deliberations, that's a, we know there's a big problem with racial discrimination in our justice system. And the court, are they going to sit by and let that happen? Or are they going to say, we've got to do something about this? We have Texas putting on an expert in eight or more cases who is saying things, r racially bigoted things, as a reason to sentence people to death or as a reason to convict them, it's, th it's a challenge to the court to try to find a way to deal with that. In those kinds of cases, does that, is that testimony allowed to be challenged? How can you? Well, but, I mean, can you basically can you, can you just say the guy's the guy's Looney Tunes or he's full of it? I don't think so. I mean, you, once he says it, first of all, yeah. there's nothing you can do about right. it. Uh, but it, it, even if the judge said, "Hey, jurors, don't listen to that," but I, I, we don't. We have not done that. Maybe that's the solution here. But the courts have not said, "Hey, that testimony was was bigoted. Throw it out. You can't listen to that." Uh, so these two cases indicate an underlying problem of racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. It's a big problem. Uh, and police behavior is a big problem. There's another case on the docket involving police who deliberately falsified a drug test. They said it was, it was ecstasy, that's an illegal drug, instead of the perfectly legal drug that the person had. He, they arrested him, he stayed in jail for a month and a half until the prosecutor determined that uh, the police had deliberately lied to put this person in jail. The person is now suing the police and the court has to decide whether he has a viable legal action. You would think that of course the answer is he has a viable legal action, but our court sometimes gets so tied up with technicalities and difficult. That case was argued today, we, I think. Very little time left, yeah. okay, a minute or so left here. Trinity Lutheran Church, though, uh, versus Pauli. Uh, this was a state financial aid to religious uh, institutions. That's important to us because we have the same state yes. constitutional provision that that state has. It's a state constitutional provision that says no state funds can be used to aid religion. In this case, a religious school wanted state funds to repave their playground. And, they, and the, uh, the people who run that program say, we can't let you in because you're a religious group. And so the religious group says, hey, you're discriminating against religion. You're not treating us equally. And the state says, yeah, we can't treat you equally because if we did that, we'd be violating the state constitution because the state constitution says don't give money to religious groups. So the question is, is the state constitution, and it's the Arizona constitution also constitutional? With this court, the makeup as it is, eight members as they are, um, these cases we've talked about, the two involving race and juries and court proceedings, and this one uh, involving financial aid to religious institutions, veering left, veering right? My guess is that if you, if you look at things that way, it's veering left. And certainly, if Clinton appoints the next justice, it's going to veer left. If, if Trump appoints the next justice, it'll stay the way it's been, which is a relatively conservative court with Kennedy moving to the left. But then, if he's president, he's going to fill the next couple of vacancies, and that could substantially change the court. Wow. Well, when it happens, we'll get you back. It just <laughs> seems like everyone's just kind of waiting around for this, and mm -hmm. you just keep waiting. That's right. And you won't know, we won't have a good idea until after the election. Yeah. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an insider. 
you'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at PBS's great performances, a staple of fine art programming on public television for more than 40 years. Joining us now is the executive producer of Great Performances, David Zorn. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Well, thank you so much for being here. I know you just flew in from New York. I mean, well, it's really, you know, I'd only been in Arizona once before. It was back in the 80s. I was doing a show uh, with Linda Ronstadt, Canciones de Me Padre. So we went and visited with her father because that was the tradition that she had learned, the type of songs she learned from her father. It was out in the Sonora Desert. I sure. filmed her riding horses, all sorts of stuff. It's a beautiful place. So you had that Arizona experience. Now you're seeing a little bit of the urban experience that we've got here. Yeah, but this is unique for me because um, a lot of people don't know. I think I was Walter Cronkite's producer longer than anybody. My goodness, and here you are at the Cronkite School, huh? I know, I had heard about it, and I never had the opportunity to come, and it, it's just a fantastic facility. Oh, there it's is. It's great to see the students here working, but uh, Walter hosted the uh, Vienna New Year's concert. That's right. On that's New Year's right. Day that, for 24, that's right. 24 for, years. Think of him as space shots and you know assassinations and all this kind of bit, no. but he did that as well. He loved music. He, we let him conduct a couple times, you know. Well, I grew up in Cape Canaveral, and that was another thing I shared with Walter because oh, of, of his love for the space program. My father worked in the space program, and of course he was such a, a proponent and such a huge fan. Um, how would you describe great performances? Great performances is the best in the performing arts. I mean, when I started back in 1979, primarily we were doing ballet, uh, the, primarily the works of uh, George Balanchine, uh, classical concerts, and opera. But as the years went on, it grew to become more music theater, some elements of classic rock. Uh, we had always done drama, it was the, sort of the precursor to great performances, a series called Theater in America, and, and I've expanded that uh, in my tenure. But it, it uh, you know, there is a lot of great performances out there, and uh, we can't get them all, but we try. And, and as far as the original mission, obviously you weren't there from the very beginning, but you've been there for quite a while. Right. And it sounds like the show has changed a little bit in terms of what it presents. Has the mission changed? No, the mission hasn't changed at all. I mean, you know, one thing that we do in great performances is we try to also uh, create programs that allow stations to fundraise around them. We try to do, uh, we've done a lot of programs with Andrea Bocelli. I introduced Michael Buble to the world, uh, Josh Groban, uh, programs with David Foster. So it's that kind of variety. It helps us support the, the fine arts as well. I was going to ask you, how are programs selected for great performances? I mean, are, do you have a list? Have you, are these things that are familiar, maybe unfamiliar, but you're taking a flyer on? How does that work? Well, we've been around for so long, you know, that a lot of people know who we are, that we have ongoing relationship. Uh, part of great performances is great performances at the Met. And there's 10 to 11 operas from the Metropolitan Opera. So I, in, in that particular genre, I look at it as my job to try to find something occasionally from Europe, one of the better opera companies in Europe, our regional our opera companies. We've done a lot with Lyric Opera of Chicago, San Francisco, LA Opera, Dallas. You know, we want to find that balance, and and in doing that, we've also encouraged the the uh, American opera companies to to try new works, trying to introduce new things into the repertoire. And I was going to ask you about that, the idea of the dynamic, if you will, between the well-known classics, things people are familiar mm -hmm. with, and those maybe unheard of gems that you think people should at least experience and know that's out there. Yeah. How do you, how do you work that balance? Well, it's, it's just trying to, you know, we don't sit there and go, we're going to have X amount of these or X amount of those. Things come to us. And, you know, uh, an upcoming show we have is a new work. It's based on the Ann Paget novel, Bel Canto, you know, yes. which is a very famous story. Yes, she's, a, she's, by the way, she's a hoot. She is a, <laughs> a terrific lady, but it's a contemporary opera and an opportunity 
to, again, try to get something new in the repertoire. But opera is not all we do. We do a lot of other disciplines as well. And too. That, that goes into the similar uh, question that I just asked. The other discipline, I mean, people tune into great performances. They're going to expect opera. They're going to expect classic theater in some way, shape, or form. Yes. Um, how do you make sure they also get something that might surprise them? Well, we look around. You know, being in New York, there's a lot of experimental things that happen. Um, back in when I started, we were on 52 weeks a year, so it was easier to, to have, yeah. you know, a lot more unusual things. But, you know, we've done things like, you know, you wouldn't expect us to do a show on clowns. And Bill Irwin, who oh, was yeah. kind of a new age clown, yes. and David Shiner, that would be something that, you know, you would tune in and not expect. But, you know, at the same time, I understand that people, somebody that likes a symphony may not like opera, may not like, you know, a musical theater. So it's, you know, it's trying to find something for everybody. For those who don't know if they like symphony, opera, or musical theater, how do you attract them? You, if you have a real quality performance and you have dynamic artists, you know, I think you get sucked into it. I mean, we, one of the harder things in classical music is trying to find those people that communicate sophisticated musical ideas, like Leonard Bernstein. Trying to find people along the way. There was some success with Michael Tilson Thomas, who is a, at San Francisco mm -hmm. Symphony, and also the New World in Miami, which is a, a training orchestra for, for students that have graduated. He's down there experimenting a lot, but he's a great communicator on you know, contemporary American music and drawing you know, lines to things in the past. And I ask that question because with social media and the internet, it has mm -hmm. become a short attention span yes. world. Again, how do you break through that? How do you attract those who've got their face on a screen most of the day? Well, I think we have a, a show coming up on uh, Alexander Hamilton. And the musical has really attracted a lot of interest in a in a diverse and younger audience. You, you know, the, the show's two blocks from my office and you walk down past the street and the people that are lining up to try to get tickets and the lottery, it's, it's not your normal Broadway audience. So we're using social media opportunities with Hamilton more than we've ever done. It's an opportunity because it's hard. You know, when you produce something, you know, in, in the quality that we do, whether it's from uh, a Broadway stage or the Metropolitan Opera, I'm not quite sure I want people watching it on their phone because you don't get the, the same type of experience. It's not really, you know, it's not as content driven. You have to, you can't casually look at it on your phone. So that's an interesting, it, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting <laughs> point because now people have 60 inch television screens in their Correct. living room. You can possibly, uh, has that changed how some of these performances are photographed or videotaped or broadcast, if yeah, you well, will? Yeah, well, I would, you know, we used to say, or our saying was that television was always a secondary experience. You should go to the theater and experience your, yourself. But that kind of changed with high-definition television. I mean, it didn't work at all with 3D, which we, everybody, it looked like a hologram. <laughs> and, and we abandoned that quickly, but with the high-definition, the experience, I mean, for example, my mother-in-law was a patron at the Met, had, she was a trained opera singer. She had the seats a little higher up where the sound was the best, but she likes to go to the HD operas in cinema now because it's a better yeah. experience. You can see what people are doing, you know? So there is good and bad with that, you know, because some, sometimes it cannibalizes people actually buying tickets. I, well, and I was going to ask yeah. that as well. Yeah. I mean, a lot of events, even sporting events now, they're yeah. trying to figure out how to get people through the turnstiles yeah. as opposed to in front of that 60-inch yeah. screen. Uh, but I'm excited, just on the technological point, I mean, where the, 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 you know, to do these shows, the kind of shows, the big shows we do are very expensive, a lot of union, a lot of performers, lots of rights that you have to acquire. We're trying, we're, we're getting into the streaming business, you know, where that's a part of the business plan. And I think, you know, we experimented with digital cinema, which works to a certain degree, but I think that is really the future. I think, you know, I hate to say this, in an environment like this, broadcast is going to be a thing of the past, except for public television, because it's free over the air. All right, all right, we'll let you leave the building now that you've uh, qualified. <laughs> We've got about 30 seconds sure. left here. In all these years, your favorite great performance. 
My favorite great performance, if people ask me that, is Gospel at Colonus. It starred Morgan Freeman, and it was the Oedipus story at Colonus told as if it were a, you know, a gospel service. And they had a whole history of, they had Clarence Fountain and the five blind boys from Alabama actually play Oedipus. Oh my goodness. So that it was really been terrific. Absolutely. Course, anything with Pavarotti. All right. Well, <laughs> again, welcome to Arizona. Good to have you here. back here and, and continued success with great performances. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Funding for Curate. The Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society members Eleanor Light and Judith Hards, and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on Arizona PBS. For more information, call 602-496-8888.